Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you to uh, ongoing series that Miller Thompson and Carson International have been hosting. Uh, my name is Dave Pentland. I'm the Vice President of Carson International. With me today, again, is Dan Kisselback from Miller Thompson, who is a partner and leads their uh, uh, division that looks after customs, trade laws, and uh, all the heavy lifting that uh, often I require his assistance on. So today we're going to take a look at uh, e-commerce and sort of what the pandemic has done to the e-commerce space. And uh, um, just want to start off a little um, Charles Darwin, I thought is, uh, um, Dan mentioned that this is not uh, Charles Darwin's quote, but somehow it got attributed to him. So it's, uh, I think it's very apropos today that it's uh, not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It's the one that's the most adaptable to change. So um, we're de definitely during a period of change right now. And uh, this pandemic has certainly uh, drawn on and uh, strengthened sort of what's happened in the e-commerce space. Um, next slide, Alfie. So e-commerce, uh, quickly, it's traditionally, this has been where uh, businesses were involved in brick and mortar operations uh, and uh, involved, you know, physical space, uh, people to people contact and uh, networks of clients, suppliers, uh, partners, and uh, there was face-to-face -face interaction. You went into a store, you exchanged money. And so business not only are shifting to digital business models, but they have shifted and there's certainly many uh, companies, certainly we've seen a uh, robust startup in companies that uh, look not to get into the bricks and mortar space. They're setting up their business to be entirely online. So this online platform is, is another uh, means that they're looking at uh, bypassing uh, where you're going to get hop in your car, head to the mall and buy something to where you'll, strictly be able to access uh, certain types of goods online. So COVID-19 has done a lot of terrible things to our, uh, uh, to our society, but it's also provided businesses uh, an opportunity to step back and develop and adapt to digital strategy to shape their business model. Uh, next slide. I just want to mention that uh, bricks and mortar retailers from, you know, sports authority to toys or us are closing their stores and, and closing down all altogether. And Amazon, eBay, Jetcom, big commerce, Shopify uh, have motivated uh, the traditional bricks and mortar brands to change the way they operate. And in some cases now uh, we get more options online than in the store. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Good point. And, and this e-commerce is not just a matter of simply somebody ordering something online, exchanging money, and a package arrives at your door. It, it really requires a digital adoption that requires you understand all the applications of uh, digital technology to take a full advantage of the capabilities. Um, so for this reason, skill sets for existing personnel will be need to be upgraded and where needed people having specific technical skills sets need to be hired to develop and implement a successful digital strategy. So in our case, I look in our organization where IT is always the guys that had the wild ideas that made everything work. They become a valuable part of our, um, our sales marketing team, our customer service, our engagement team. And like other organizations, you, you rely heavily on these individuals. So, um, and sort of one size does not fit all to every organization. Um, I, I think you have to assess your organizational uh, needs, resources, and yeah, and you need to uh, set up the people and training required to uh, to get involved. So, next slide. Just a comment that uh, uh, you know, e-commerce marketing is broad and diverse, and, and it ranges from pay-per-click advertising to blogging and search engine optimization. So there's all sorts of different types of uh, individuals and skill sets that are required to really get going on this in this area. Yeah, that, that's true. And, and it really, it requires you need to adopt uh, a strategy that, uh, that takes into account all your business functions. And, and in our case, that not only does it involve international borders, domestic, but you have to look at the big picture and see what technologies that work well uh, with, with a really uh, without overlapping capabilities. Um, and, and so I think you need to kind of look 
uh, look at some uh, types of questions that need to look at developing how you strategy and uh, potential solutions. So in our case, we have companies come to, are they really ready to export? You might be set up for uh, domestic e-commerce, but really are you ready to export and get your product across borders and in different places in the world? Um, and do you have the skills necessary to develop, implement, and maintain a digital business? So next slide. Yeah, just a comment that, uh, you know, when you're ready to export, you might not, you might need some a little bit of advice. Uh, there's this little story about when Coca-Cola uh, came to China, it was given a Chinese name that sounded kind of similar, but the characters used for the name meant bite the wax tadpole. And uh, so it wasn't really overly great from a marketing standpoint. Another one was uh, in, uh, in the case of Chevy, uh, they sold the Nova in Venezuela, which uh, in Spanish meant doesn't go. So uh, you have to think about things such as the name of your product and the country of origin and the color of your packaging and all those wonderful things. Yeah, great point. Next slide. So, uh, I mean, you have to, the digital solution, it, it really gets involved in your purchasing, your manufacturing. Inventory control is a big one. Where, where do you now have your inventory? The traditional method where you would uh, buy goods, bring goods in, have them in your warehouse, and then sell those into the marketplace doesn't necessarily hold fact. Now you may want to look at, do you need the inventory in the country where you're domiciled? Maybe you need the inventory in the country where your uh, biggest customer base is. And that involves bringing those goods into that, uh, that place. So, and you know, there's different user roles provided by solutions um, and you have to access rights uh, to needs to be assigned to different people within the company. And I spoke of IT, IT is one that, you know, they were the people that, uh, connected everybody's uh, computers. So we just spoke with everybody within the company. Now there are people that have to be involved in uh, the uh, movement of the goods uh, to and from different places in the world and, and what's involved in that. So, so digital solutions make employees more productive. <clears throat> I mean, you have to help them do their work and more effectively and collaborate better. So what types of tools and functionality would employees appreciate? Um, so management uh, needs to be driving this uh, and uh, over the next, you know, in here we put five years and once, you know, we put five years, years in there, I thought, you know, you need to kind of first, where do you need to be in three months, six months, a year? Five years is a big stretch, especially within the COVID uh, place, but certainly you need a strategy and you need to support the plan. So next slide, please. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you're using certain uh, e-commerce platforms such as uh, uh, Amazon or Shopify or whatever, uh, some of that uh, heavy lifting will be done. If you're, if you're looking at it from your own uh, standpoint of being integrated and, and dealing with these issues, you know, a strong digital support team might include like a director of commerce who is heading the strategy and executing on e-commerce goals, an e-commerce program manager who can help manage the process and ensure that uh, information is quickly sh shared with retail partners, a digital marketing manager, a marketing manager, a graphic designer, and a copywriter, and an e-commerce business manager who mo monitors the brand objectives and key uh, uh, results, key performance indicators, and those sort of Those are the types of individuals that you need to uh, have within the organization if you're gonna um, have an integrated uh, uh, internal system. And and without going to uh, all of them uh, on the screen, you can see that those are, as Dan mentioned, you've got technical support people, customer support, payment processing, supply chains, uh, um, and, and certainly legal expertise to make sure that you know, you're not uh, um, you're protecting intellectual property in inter international markets. So uh, so this is a big big item. If if you've got a brand that you've protected your market not only do you need to protect in your market, you need to protect it in other markets you're selling into and maybe even markets you're not selling into. So next slide, please. Intellectual property um, and, and standards seem to be the biggest things like for electrical goods or food products, that kind of thing. It's important to make sure that the goods that are being uh, imported into the uh, destination country 
are compliant with uh, the laws of that country. Otherwise, it can lead to seizures and penalties and other bad things. Yeah. And um, when we're on the topic of e-commerce, uh, you, uh, we need to point out that cybersecurity is very, very important these days because as you reach out to corners of the world, uh, you can be vulnerable to cyber attacks. And if your business is 100% online, you need to implement measures to protect your digital assets in, in pretty much five key areas. So there's identification, protection, detection, response, and recovery. And, and, and this is our IT department. We're, we're in a service business. We don't have um, as uh, robust where we're, we're uh, tracking parcels, but certainly uh, we need to protect the information that we have on, on behalf of our clients. And, and I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that actually the insurance companies these days can actually uh, give you protection for the cost of recovering from a cyber attack. Now, I don't know the ins and outs on it and how you're compensated for it, but certainly uh, um, insurance is available. So next slide. Yeah, it may be necessary for uh, a person that's getting into uh, this area to do a gap analysis, that is assessing the current state determining what are the uh, standards of the day in, term, uh, in terms of protecting uh, information and cybersecurity, and then implementing a project uh, or a program to get you to the future state that is uh, compliant. Uh, things like using uh, usernames and passwords, which are the keys to the castle, making sure that, that, is, uh, that you're, you're doing those, those things to update on a regular basis. And uh, some folks do so, uh, go so far as to do uh, penetration testing to see how uh, vulnerable their systems are to cyber security attacks. Yeah, and, and some best practices, and these have come some, with, from some 3PLs that uh, we work with that I, th I think do a pretty uh, robust job. Um, businesses have to automate fulfillment tasks to scale. I mean, best practices uh, need to connect sales channels uh, to shipping. So businesses serving multiple sales channels uh, can continue to sell products after stockouts and error, which actually develop separate and inefficient processes. And so the days are gone where somebody would place an order, you pick it out of the shelf. Now you maybe have um, orders uh, arriving online and uh, be taking orders saying you're gonna fulfill the orders, but if uh, your stock is not, um, uh, you haven't uh, developed a process that uh, uh, says that goods are being picked, you, you may be um, uh, setting yourself up for uh, false reports to your customers. And so warehouse management is the same. It has uh, order volume. Uh, it looks, uh, your error rates tend to rise as employees rush to keep up with demand. We'll certainly see this when Amazon has their prime days uh, um, October 13th and 14th the next week where they um, they have all hands on base and they uh, pick and and uh, their uh, error rates rise as they push their employees to, to the uh, to the max so um, you need the right technology to uh, make sure that these things are, are put in place shipping this is something that we get involved in um, shipping growth uh, also leads to higher than expected shipping costs. And if shipping processes are not automated, uh, that automating the handoff of customer address information to carriers reduces manual labor and streamlines labor creation. So the barcode, barcode reader was probably the biggest uh, um, uh, addition to uh, fulfillment of e-commerce before even um, e-commerce happened. So um, it, it's enabled to the companies uh, to offer comprehensive delivery services, real-time tracking, and multiple international shipping options just with the use of a bar, barcode. So next slide. Yeah, in terms of best practices, the things that I see most frequently is have a great website and also have uh, multiple ways of paying for the goods. And then finally, in terms of shipping, uh, offer free shipping. I mean, they, most folks say that, you know, we know that free shipping is not really free. Somebody's got to pay for it. But uh, thanks to companies such as Amazon, most customers today shopping online expect free shipping and they have the, uh, you know, the stats to back them up. So 28% um, of customers will abandon their cart if free shipping is not available. Uh, and then, you know, further with the shipping aspect, show customers the expected delivery date and then take action as soon as possible if, if there is a shipping problem and accept responsibility. Deal with the shipping issue because it's so huge with e-commerce. 
So in e-commerce uh, under Kusma or the USMCA was, was a big part of the discussion when they started negotiating um, the new agreement. Um, they actually would set out rules that will facilitate economic growth and trade opportunities um, through the internet as well as address potential barriers to digital trade. So these rules included commitments to, to not apply duties to digital products transmitted electronically um, to protect personal information and to cooperate on important security issues in electronic communications. Now this is irregardless of the value of the goods. We're now just talking about the information that's being transmitted between Kusma uh, parties. So, and in this case, Canada, the United States and Mexico. So digital trade uh, chapter uh, ensures that Canadian companies are able to take advantage of expanding online commercial opportunities. Now that's not to say that we um, both agreed the countries on the value that should enter in our, our countries, but we did ag agree on the processes uh, to enter into our countries. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please, Alfie. Thank you. Um, so chapter 19 is, is all about digital trade and uh, it, it, it supports uh, the viability of the digital economy by ensuring that potential impediments to both consumers and businesses um, are embracing this medium of trade are addressed. And, and this is really important. Uh, E-commerce is here to stay and this pandemic has pushed us to, uh, you know, I, I kind of jokingly and, and, and as long as uh, nobody pushes Amazon to come after me for saying it, but I've almost said that this is almost the Amazon pandemic, not the COVID-19 pandemic, because this is sort of a dream for them to come true where you force people to hunker down within their uh, places of, uh, of their, uh, their, where they're domiciled and order everything online because they're not allowed to go out and shop or they, they think that shopping is dangerous. So it is, yeah, I kind of affectionately call it as the Amazon pandemic. So don't quote me on it, please. Yeah, there's um, several, several uh, articles in there that protect e-commerce and are designed is exactly to facilitate e-commerce e uh, ranging from, you know, uh, electronic uh, authentic authentication and, and electronic signatures to online consumer protection. Yeah. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so yeah, chapter 19 also ensures that Canadian firms can capitalize on the data and the digital opportunities, both here at home and globally through commitments that protect the free flow of information across borders and minimize the data localization requirements while preserving Canada's right to protect data for compelling public policy pro purposes. So um, now, it prevents governments in Kusma countries from demanding access to an uh, enterprise's proprietary software, software source code. So um, this, is, this is fairly important. And uh, unfortunately, or, or fortunately, um, some of the bigger guys like Facebook um, have, um, are using this as a way to, um, um, how would I say politically quick, uh, eliminate the need that they are forced to provide uh, information to uh, government bodies. So um, um, both the parties maintaining measures to protect users uh, unauthorized disclosure and, um, and we're still seeking to promote access to information communication technologies for person with disabilities. That language is in there because we need to ensure that uh, people with disabilities have access all the time to the same as uh, like uh, uh, able-bodied people. So next slide, please. Um, and this is just language within Kusma that said that we're not, uh, um, we still have the right to our, our domestic laws and policies and regulations pertaining to net neutrality. And so I'm going to go to the next slide. I uh, this uh, commitments to uh, use um, uh, publicly available uh, information is of interest to me because uh, perhaps at some point these Canada Border Services Agency will be um, catching up with the U.S. and making available information relevant to rulings uh, because it says the parties shall endeavor to cooperate to identify ways in which parties can expand access and use to government information, including data that the party has made public. So, uh, 
And we've done a separate session on uh, USMC and uh, Kusma on Section 321, but um, it's, it's just interesting to point out that this was really pushed very big uh, in 2015 and passed in 2016, where the de minimis importations in the United States is uh, the uh, elimination of any duty and taxes on goods that are less than 800 US dollars going into the United States. And so this is part of a, a Trade Facilitation Trace Enforcement Act that o the Obama uh, government pushed through just before, um, um, six months before they left office. And it is a huge, huge push on the e-commerce sector in the United States and used by everybody from Amazon to Alibaba to companies in Canada uh, exporting goods to the States. So. Yeah, so this uh, this exemption is uh, it applies to uh, lower or eliminate duties uh, not only to the base uh, MFN tariff but to uh, our most favored nation tariff, but also to section what's known as section 301 tariffs, uh, such as those in place uh, for, uh, against uh, goods imported from China, uh, and as a result of this exemption. Um, there's been a, a skyrocketing uh, growth in uh, B to C commerce. Um, yeah. So. yeah, that's a good point. You, you could have a 25% duty on denim jeans from Canada and the United States. You could also have additional 301, um, as we affectionately call them, a, a Trump duty of 25%. Both duty is eliminated. So great point. Next slide. Um, uh, and, and this is the goods enter into the United States without a formal entry, meaning it, it can actually clear on a manifest uh, generated by an express courier, like such as uh, a UPS, a FedEx, a DHL, or even cartridge companies that can actually transmit the information to customers directly. Um, so since September of last year, uh, CVP has been testing um, a, a new type of entry called a Type 86. And this covers Section 321 shipments that have not been uh, allowed to be brought into the United States because they're subject to other government agencies, such as uh, US FDA, um, uh, 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 any kind of uh, um, um, automotive uh, products uh, covered by a DOT. So, so this, these are actually types of low value entries. And so it, it's going to open up the, it, or it has opened up the market for, uh, for goods that were, could not qualify under section 321 in the past. So next slide. Um, and I'm not going to go into that, that it's just, um, it's, it's talking about how these uh, section 321 goods on uh, um, that uh, the type is uh, able to um, uh, access and give the information to the PGAs required by uh, by uh, the the United States government. So next slide, please. Just one uh, comment. Uh, there has been uh, some discussion about uh, people being tempted not to worry about compliance at all if they're going to use the de minimis uh, exemption. And I, th I would suggest that's probably not a great strategy because if goods are not compliant with other uh, legislation pertaining to, say, for example, the protection of intellectual property and so forth, they still could be uh, caught and you could end up with cargo holds and seizures and all these wonderful uh, things can happen, uh, which would uh, not be good from a business standpoint. So compliance still is an important issue. Yeah, that's a great point, Dan, because uh, if you do get flagged by U.S. Customs, um, they, they will actually flag, uh, and if and you're repetitive in nature, they will flag you uh, as your company and you'll be prohibited from being involved in the Section 321 process. So certainly um, this new type of entry and this uh, this manifest process, it, it's, it's doing couple things. It's ensuring e-commerce uh, shipments in the United States are uh, able to cross the borders, but it also enhances the capacity of CBP to target inbound consignments uh, based on risk profile and enforced trade laws. So don't think it's, it's a pass um, on um, following through on what required uh, and what's legally allowed in the United States. Um, it's, it's twofold. One, it, it, it uh, makes uh, entry of goods that are uh, 
that are able to uh, fulfill all the obligations uh, um, across in the United States, but at the same time, customs uh, will target uh, companies and, um, and, and their monopoly. And if you get barred from the United States and your livelihood is selling in the United States, uh, I would say that uh, that's a, uh, um, a business plan that I wouldn't follow. So, so many fulfillment centers enable e-commerce merchants to outsource the warehousing and shipping. And, and this relieves online business from necessary physical space to store all products. Um, so there's a lot of benefits from uh, merchants without capacity to directly manage inventory. So using today's technology um, to, um, you don't have to take title, your, well, you'll take title to your goods. You don't physically have to take title. You can actually use a 3PL in a country like Canada and access the United States. And so this eliminates the requirements for you to actually lease office space if you're using 3PL or using the Amazons and that marketplace. So. Next so slide. we've been de de dealing with uh, two different uh, 3PL kind of structures uh, and, and foreign trade zones and so forth. One is uh, uh, importation into Canada and then exporting into the U.S. under the de minimis uh, 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 with uh, using the de minimis level and the other uh, importing into the U.S. and then using the foreign trade zone to import into Canada and uh, different considerations uh, apply and they may be useful to different uh, importers at different times. Definitely. Yeah. And so there's many 3PLs uh, companies specifically now I'm talking about in Canada that are understanding the needs to provide tailor-made solutions for e-commerce as more of a retail and wholesale businesses alike start trading online. So many companies have started integrating the use of e-commerce with low value shipments in the United States. So you can actually bring your goods into Canada, pay duty to Canada customs, apply to get that duty back and then access the US market without a duty component being built into your, your cost, your goods being sold to the customer. Um, so I think from speaking on a Canadian point, this is a tremendous opportunity for small, medium sized companies to sell into the United States from Canada at a much lower price than some of their bigger, larger clients that actually import goods directly into the United States. So, next slide, please. So this is where I'm gonna maybe turn over to Dan. Uh, we get into the messy area of Canadian tax issues. So um, my big comment is that um, GST is, it seems to be one that uh, e-commerce uh, is, um, is picked up on import, but when you get into some of the PST, there's some uh, some things that uh, we should look at that uh, whether you wanna be on side, are you on side, and that our governments uh, around the world are gonna have to look closely at how they capture uh, some of the provincial tax issues or state tax issues because the day when I could go into a store and I could never be exempt at the till from paying a provincial sales tax is somewhat blurred when you buy something online. So uh, I'll turn it over to you, Dan. Okay, well, I don't wanna frighten everybody with a long, boring tax presentation. I, I guess what I wanna say uh, in a nutshell, my takeaway is, um, as uh, I said in another presentation last week, uh, as a late, a great Yogi Berra said, uh, uh, if you don't know where you're going, you're gonna end up someplace else. So have a plan to deal with taxes. Invariably, there are going to be taxes that are applied on account of sales or use in Canada. It's the GST, uh, HST, uh, QST, PST, depends upon where the goods are being sold. In the United States, same deal. Uh, there are sales, understanding sales tax is essential. Uh, sales tax is governed at the, at the state level. Uh, and, uh, you know, the question is, when do you have to do it? You have to figure out where you're selling into and whether or not, uh, generally speaking, there is a nexus. A nexus can be established by um, a business that's carrying on business and uh, you may have um, different legislation that says that you have a nexus. Typically, those types of uh, provisions um, identify either a permanent establishment, some sort of office, workshop, warehouse or something like that, inventory, uh, uh, you know, goods in the, in the, in the jurisdiction, uh, affiliates, is there an affiliate uh, company or business 
or economic uh, factors such as sales volume or transactions within the state. So have a plan to deal with it. I've had to, uh, you know, make a voluntary disclosure for a large oil company uh, that uh, did not realize that there were two tax points when you import goods into Canada. There is one at the time of importation, that's the import GST that the importer must pay. And then there is the domestic sale in Canada GST, which the uh, vendor has to uh, charge the customer and, and collect the GST. And, they, and, the, um, and the oil company forgot about the first tax point, which is the import tax point, and ended up having to pay uh, and collect later on $60 million in GST. And, and it wasn't the fact that, uh, that it was payable because they could collect it back, but it caused a, an awful um, uh, potential uh, cash flow issue. So on to the next slide, uh, Alfie. Uh, in, uh, this is a dense slide. Uh, basically, uh, the story here is that uh, many non-resident importers seem to be not charging GST, and that puts them at a competitive uh, advantage to the bricks and mortar stores in Canada. Um, the governments are paying attention to this and I expect this to be a large audit issue going forward. So if you are a non-resident importer, make have a plan that is defensible uh, for either collecting and remitting the, the GST or if you're not going to do that, ha have, a, have a reason why you're not doing that. Otherwise you uh, could um, acquire a um, tax liability over time that could be quite substantial. On to the next slide, please. Here we have a nice eye chart uh, for you uh, dealing with the issues of uh, uh, how much uh, tax is payable, uh, generally speaking. Um, figure this out because, you know, I, I have one case right now where we're dealing with the importation of a huge uh, warehouse and the contract was signed in Europe. And the uh, issue of the GST, PST uh, was not uh, as, as, as considered as, as best as, as it could have been and there are problems. So uh, figure out where you're selling into and whether or not there is a uh, provincial sales tax as well as the GST uh, that is applicable. Not every province applies the HST, which is the harmonized sa sales tax. On to the next slide. So uh, I guess the bottom line is what uh, I mentioned, uh, the uh, issue of, um, of GST and sales tax and QST is an important one. And if you're going to go online and make sales, um, undoubtedly auditors are gonna be tracking things and they will see whether or not you uh, are a company that is charging and, uh, and then they'll, uh, decide whether or not you're a good audit target or not as a result. On to the next slide. Similarly, in the US, uh, there has been a burgeoning of e-commerce. And uh, although uh, it's, it seems at some points the governments are almost overwhelmed with the e-commerce issue, there are strategies that are underway in North America, uh, both in Canada and the US, uh, to deal with compliance issues. So uh, it's better to have a good plan now and a strategy to justify actions on compliance uh, from the get-go before you acquire uh, potential liability going forward. Next slide, please. So uh, here, the custom strategy uh, encompasses uh, four uh, primary goals, uh, you know, engaging authorities, uh, you know, adapting affected CBP operations, uh, driving private sector compliance, and facilitating international trade standards. And I know that uh, the CBP and the CBSA are discussing these issues as we speak. Next slide, please. So the strategy highlights uh, the need for engagement on the part of the private industry to assist in uh, ensuring compliance on the part of their customers uh, going forward with the government. So the governments recognize that they alone cannot do this. They need to have partners within business to ensure that there is compliance on the part of their customers. And uh, there are strategies as well as enforcement initiatives that will be uh, developed and, and continuing uh, to be developed to do uh, just that, to target certain high risk activities 
and to partner with uh, businesses um, and importers to ensure compliance. Next, please. So uh, as David has uh, outlined, uh, e-commerce is growing like a hockey stick up. Uh, we expect to see probably in the range of 20% uh, of all retail e-commerce in the next uh, year or two. Uh, it is uh, a trend that uh, uh, it will continue in the foreseeable future. And uh, the uh, businesses that are able to take advantage of the e-commerce trend uh, will be able to adapt and survive and in fact thrive. So uh, with that, I would like to end and turn it over to you, David. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, I just think it's, uh, it's something when you can start off with a Darwin quote, and then we got to end the, with an e-commerce one from Jeff Bezos, who he's uh, quoted saying, if you're competitor focused, you have to wait until there is a competitor doing something. But being customer focused allows you to be more pioneering. So I think we're in a, a new world where this pandemic is is pushed the resources of companies to take a look long and hard at their digital platforms and their strategies and invest in new uh, money and skills for their employees and and look at linking everything together to access and be able to get goods to the consumer's home. And so whether I'm involved in it, moving goods around the world and clearing it through customs, or Dan's involved in setting up evaluation, it, it takes a lot of planning. So um, I appreciate people li listening in today. And um, if you have any thoughts, comments, questions, by all means, reach out to myself or to Dan. And uh, thanks again, Dan, for you and Miller Thompson taking part in this. and. Um, have you got any last uh, comments or? No, thanks. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, always be uh, always happy to be part of the team. And thanks everyone for joining us. We'll uh, have, this is one of uh, a series of presentations on hot uh, customs international trade topics. And we'll have another one in the hopper uh, very shortly. Great. Thanks everybody. Bye for now.